All right, well, it's good to see everybody. Um, so I think what we'll do is we will finish up chapter number 10, no, chapter number nine, which is functionals. And so um, Ryan said, he, or Robert said he was gonna finish that tonight. And then, so I'm just gonna turn it over to you. Cool, I'm gonna share my screen and we can get started. Um, cool. So uh, let's see, yeah, I think we love stuff on point three this is called uh per style um i think just as a uh jesus uh so i make sure uh yeah so yeah we, we were we we're you know obviously we've been learning about all the different types of mapping functions right um learning you know uh, yeah we're just you know learning about the different types of mapping functions right there's obviously like map map double and right out returning uh based on like whatever's after that map uh bit returning the data type for that vector um and then just like learning right that i think in general right they're a bit more coherent than some of the apply functions in base are right um in terms of like just being more consistent like argument names and stuff like that and you gotta you know do i think like a lot of you're able to like i think write pretty concise code um without necessarily having to resort to loops um, with these that's just kind of you know the very short of it but um we are on 9.3 is where we left off um so this is you know talking about per style and this is you know an example where hadley you know shows a you know more realistic example where we um we fit a linear model to each like cylinder group in empty cars um and then we extract the coefficients from that. And then um, over here, we get the uh, the slope coefficient. So this is like pretty cool, right? We're able to, uh, obviously, like, I think we're all, obviously, I know we're all, you know, use a tidyverse, right? And like day-to-day -day stuff. So we're able to take advantage of that with, uh, with per. Um, so in this case, uh, we're first splitting empty cars by uh, the cylinder. So this creates a list where each uh, each element is a uh, subset of like the whole empty cars data frame when the element's name is however, however many uh, cylinders is um, how many you know how many cylinders um, is associated with like these rows in the data frame, and then we just apply um, in this case right we're we're just varying the element right in this case dot x in this case is just by cell so we're just applying to a uh, linear model to each um, element of the list um, map coefficient that will then um, extract the coefficients right uh, for each list and then map double two remember um, with uh, internally map double can use pluck um, if you give it the element of a um, if you give it like whatever element of uh, of a sublist, so in this case, uh, map double two is extracting just the slope coefficient, and you know, pretty cool, right? It's like you're able to just use two map, well, three maps in this case, um, and you know, has this like pretty concise code and arguably like still pretty readable. Um, um, this is you would do it in base R. Um, also, not really too bad. Maybe you could like argue that this is a bit more verbose, right? With the uh, the function, the anonymous function is using, uh, you know, function data. And then, uh, you know, you can maybe argue it's a bit more verbose than like up here where we're using um, the per anonymous function. Uh, but, you know, still pretty close. Um, oh, geez, my, did my mouse die? Oh, sorry. One sec. We can still hear you. Yep, and see cool. you. Okay. And see you. Uh, you guys hear me? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So weird. Oh. Everything just disconnected. Yeah, your oh. connection's a little slow. I think. Yeah, well, you're here. No. You're here. Okay. It happens to me sometimes. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay. Wait. Let me try this. Let me. The VPN. That was a VPN issue. Sometimes I have that. Yeah. Is, do you guys hear me now? Fine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Literally everything just for some reason is connected, like my keyboard, mouse, headphones. Oh. That was weird. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what happened. Well, Bluetooth um, problem. Okay. Yeah. Um. 
Anyway, right, this, that, like, another Chinese balloon flew overhead and jammed your uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's good. Uh, <laughs> this is still like, right, even like with base R and then the base pipe, it's still like, you know, pretty close to this. Uh, maybe it's like a bit more annoying, right? So you have to like use V apply. And then he also has like specified like the, the return type of the data, right? With this uh, double one. And then you're also like, you you know, maybe this is a bit more like clunky uh, than compared to just using math double two, um, but still not you too could, bad. You could replace oh, yep. the word function with that slash, right? You know, that uh, the new notation is a little bit more. Oh precise, yeah. But... Yep. It's also true. Um, this is a way of just doing it with, uh, with no pipe, right? So then we just save, uh, we just use L apply uh, and apply a linear model to each, um, you know, element of the list, right? And then just save that as an intermediate variable. And then we just use the apply, right? So this is just, again, kind of pretty much the same thing here, but we're just not using the pipe. And this is what we do with a for loop. Uh, so we, you know, and we create a vector. Uh, in this case, it'd be a ve vector of element three, because that's how many elements are in uh, by cell. And then you just loop through um, each of those elements, apply um, a linear model to each element, and then you just extract the coefficients. And, you know, same stuff, same deal. Um, I think like, right, with all of these, I mean, I personally just find the for loop the least readable, mostly because I think you have, I mean, again, like, it still read it. Like, this isn't obviously like some like, I mean, some weird looping code, not weird looping code, some like really like thick looping code that you might see like out in the wild, right, where you have to like kind of keep track of everything. But like, you know, there's a, definitely a lot more overhead in this case, right? Um, because you have to like, you know, you just go through the loop body and you're like, okay, what am I doing? And then I'm like grabbing each element of each loop and then you're saving this to like some output vector, right? So there's, a lot, there's just a lot more like boilerplate and overhead um, that you do have to keep um, in mind, which again, like for this example, it's like really not too bad. Um, but I, I would imagine, right, for kind of like, you know, you're working with real world data, this, and depending on like what you're doing, it might just be even easier, right, to like, you know, use a functional instead of like having to have all this like boilerplate uh, for loop code that is handled for us, luckily, um, with like map or even any of the base R functionals. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just also like good to visualize, right, the different ways um, that you can obviously approach this, this type of problem also to, I think also further reinforces that mapping is really just iteration, right? Um, so like what we're obviously doing here, we're essentially, we're essentially just like explicitly writing out the loop, but yeah, I, I guess with, you know, with R, we should, you know, more or less try to, uh, like use a functional, like when we can, um, in this case, cause it arguably produces just like more readable code and lets you like focus more on the actual operation you're doing and not all of like the boilerplate, um, bookkeeping for loop code. Hey, stuff. Robert, can you share this code? With, uh, can you share this document? Uh, is that, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Some, uh, that's really, it's super interesting. Oh, like this, this quarter document? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the, uh, I'll put it in the chat after this. Um, yeah, it's just, but it's yeah. Like, it's really nice that you set it all up, man. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, Next section is uh, map variance, right? So we've learned you know, about map function and then kind of uh, all the other uh, mapping functions that work on vectors. And now we have, uh, I think they're like, there's like 20-ish like mapping functions. Actually, there's probably now more because I think at the time of the writing, we didn't have stuff like uh, map like DFR, right? Like, or like map DFC to create um, data frames, right? With a mapping function. Um, but at least luckily, at least with the design of PER, I at least find that you really just have to learn some of like the major like families and those those variants are a modify which um essentially just right applies a functional to each element of vector and then this return type is the same type as the input uh, map two allows us to iterate over two inputs right because with map uh, we're only able to iterate over one one input but this allows us uh, now to iterate over two which is there is an example later um, where this is super helpful. IMAP iterates using an index. Um, I'll get to that one. IMAP is a is essentially just a shorthand for map two, where uh, the Y is then the names of whatever. Um, it's either the names if you, the object you're passing to it has names, or just the um, or just the or actually it then just applies to map two if it doesn't. So it's kind of it's really only useful if like the object you're passing to it has names. Uh, walk, which um, 
is pretty much similar to all of the other functions like map and whatnot. Um, but this time, but uh, it doesn't return its input. So this is like, you know, another example, right? It's like super useful if you want to like write a bunch of, um, let's say like files, right? To like a CSV or whatnot. And then PMAP. PMAP is, um, iterates over like an arbitrary number of inputs, right? So map obviously iterates over one, map two iterates over two, but then PMAP you can, uh, you can iterate over as, you know, many. Um, so let's start with modify. Um, so modify is, um, right. We essentially just like same, 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 ugh, same thing with map, right. We apply to a function to each object, um, at each element of a vector. Um, and this is useful for when we want the input data, uh, data type to be like the same, um, when we apply a function. So as example, right map, we know always returns a list. So we have some data frame, um, over here with, uh, vectors X and Y and over here, right. We're just doubling everything. The issue is, is right, this returns the list. Um, so modify will um, apply that function right to the object, but it will make sure that it doesn't uh, change the data type of it. Um, I didn't exactly find this as useful um, for, I, and what I was thinking, oh, sorry, this is also just the, um, how it would look like um, as a for loop, right? It's like really simple. You're just applying a function. Um, to the object. I didn't find this um, as useful though, uh, like compared to the other ones, mostly because I was thinking right in dplyr, we now have that cross function, right? Which then, you know, um, you can pass it like a vector of column names and maybe like apply some function to it. So modify at least didn't seem as useful to me, maybe for data frames, maybe it could be more useful for other types of objects, but I'm not sure. Um, I also had like checked the other day to see if like maybe it was going to be like superseded, right? Because sometimes the tidyverse is uh, fairly aggressive and uh, deprecating stuff. But you think you I think modify is going to be deprecated? Oh no I no mean... no! I was I was just curious. I guess like I didn't see as much utility to it. Um, I was, I, it's funny. I had this exact opposite reaction. I'm like I was okay. surprised that modify wasn't the first thing they mentioned since it's like the more general purpose. Mm. But it doesn't seem like people use modify very often. They rather they'd rather use map double or map this. You know, even if you started with a numeric vector and any of the numeric vector, I guess it does make sure that you really what's going on is what you think is going on. Whereas modify might um, you know might work, and you don't know why later why things are screwed up. Is that why thinking out loud? Yeah, I'm not sure. I remember in the chapter it was like I mean he didn't really focus on it a ton, right? Yeah. Um, it was just more like, hey, if you want to like apply some function to like your input object, and you just want to make sure that it's returned the same way, you should use modify. But like again, like I guess you know what this could maybe be useful if um if I don't know maybe you're like just using just the you know regular old data frame right, and you don't want to use tables, you, maybe you just don't want a dependency to the plier, and you're like, well maybe I'll just use like per. I don't really know why you would right. <laughs> if you're like you're gonna use per, maybe you can just use the plier. Um, but I don't know maybe that. I personally just didn't see like as much uh, utility to modify, but that could also just be yeah. like not being creative enough, I, right? In I terms guess of like from, thinking of a use case. To me, modify is the most similar to the Python map, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't change the data type of what you're modifying, I guess. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Colin, what's your experience? I mean, have you ever used modify? Or you always just use a special map double, map char, map whatever. Map uh, this was the first exposure that yeah. I've ever had to modify because yeah. I would always use either the, you know, just the straight map or, you know, the specific map. I mean, like the only way that I could see this being useful is, is like if you had a data frame that every single column was of the same type, right? Like if you had a character vector in when your data frame, would this fail? Or would it I wouldn't think it would be useful as a data for data frames as it would for like everything else. And data frame, you're right. There's a special case of data frames is too much of a blunt object. Your data frame probably has some structure to it. And you're not, when are you going to apply some function to everything in this giant data frame? It seems very hard to believe. But yeah. Unless, like you say, it's a special case. Oh, this data frame is just only numbers, and I want to, you know, round them all or something. I don't know. But well, that would be very useful. I mean, yeah. <laughs> or maybe with like matrices. Actually, maybe this or, could be useful yeah, for matrices. matrices. Yeah. Like you want to right because like I want to keep this whatever object is as a matrix, and maybe you're like applying some like you know somewhat complicated I'm, function to it, but I I literally can't think of something. 
but I mean, I could I'm looking at, I'm looking at like, there's also subfamilies to modify, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, but there's like modified at, modify at, modify depth, modify if, modify in, modify tree. Yeah. So yeah. maybe the family of function is more useful. And so you have to have yeah. a case function. So that could, yeah. that could totally no. be it. Yeah. yeah. This is the first so, time I've ever been introduced to modify. All right. So that's, that's interesting. Cause I would have thought like, from the point of view of like other programming languages like Haskell and everything else where map is a very generic function does everything much like modify does I would think oh let's start with modify this is very easy to understand it just takes whatever it is returns the same thing modifies all the elements now sometimes you want to make sure you want to enforce the type or you want to make sure you get a list you want to make sure you get this then you use the special cases so it's interesting yeah. it kind of, it's an R I think it's an R perspective though like it's, it's coming through right so the, de yeah. the kind of the default thing map is not generic it always turns whatever it is into a list which i keep running into is like oh yeah i forgot about that for me from my experience with other languages it just it causes a, uh cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway i just wanted to wondering about that appreciate yeah. it um next bit is map two so map two is pretty simple right we have map iterates over one input map two iterates over two um so this is just an example where uh we just essentially you know, take some draws from a uniform distribution. Uh, here we're just making the first element of the first uh, first element of the first sublist, right? Just NA, and then we are um, I forget what I forget exactly what this example was. Oh, I think it was like the uh, was it with weighted mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And like and like just different applying just different weights to it. Um, so if we just use the tools we've learned so far, just with the regular old map double function. Uh, this won't work so right we can apply uh the mean function to our x's right and just calculate the mean for each element in x's that's all good uh but this will fail right if we want to add um you know different weights to it and the reason this fails is that um map the just regular old map right not map two is only vectorized over the first input meaning that anything that's passed uh after it will uh be passed in as is right so in this case um w right in this case ws whatever that length is um is eight and then right that's obviously not going to work because uh dot x right uh, the first uh argument to map double is of length one um, because we're just passing right that one element of the um one element of that list uh but we have map two and map two will make this like super simple so we just in this case um we just pass X's, w, W's, and then weighted mean, and it works exactly how we expect it. Um, and same same behavior uh, with like the mapping functions where you can pass um, other arguments to the function right after um, the inputs. You can, you know, if I want to say, hey, I want to remove all of the uh, missing values right before computing the mean, um, in this case, the weighted mean, you can just do that, that like that. Um, so it's the same exact stuff um, that we see with the map function with the um, you know special dots in R, and uh, this is the it, the for loop implementation, right? The you know essentially the core of it, and it's still pretty simple, right? Um, the only difference in this case is that um, we are passing, uh, we're looping now over two struct, we're looping over two vectors, right? So in this case, we're looping over um, x and y, which also means that x and y have to be the exact same length, length right? Otherwise, this will, you know, throw an error and complain. Um, but that's like, if you compared it to the simple map function at the beginning of the chapter, it's, again, pretty much identical, except we're now just adding in this, um, this y argument. Um, but yeah, pretty easy. Uh, and then we have walk. I, <laughs> I've like tried to look up why this is called walk. I didn't find a good answer. If any of you know, would love to know. Um, cause I, I don't know why this is called walk. Well, it's um, a traditional thing in, in data, uh, algorithms, right? In algorithm of course you call it like walking the data structure when you're trying to do something oh. like parsing, when you're doing a parse or a parse tree, you've got a tree data structure and you walk the data structure and, you, and usually when you're doing a walk, you're doing it for some side effect. You know, usually like building up a different data structure or whatever, but it's a side effect. So this is a side effect situation. So well, thanks. That, that is my question. Because <laughs> I was like, I don't know why this is called you know, that. Tree walking um, interpreter. There's like a, like a very common example is like a simple as possible interpreter of a language is what's called a tree walking interpreter, which just walks the tree and does, you know, instead of most, like most languages like R, you, instead of tree walking, you actually take the, 
the parse tree from the language and convert it into something else like bytecode or something first before you interpret it. But got it. Well, thank you. That's that now I know. Because <laughs> I was like, I don't know why this is called this. Um, yeah. I don't have a computer <laughs> science background. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, walk is super useful if we uh, right if we want to uh, use some function and essentially call it for its side effects, right? So it's like essentially modifying the state outside of the function. It's like writing stuff to disk is a very good example of that, um, or printing stuff to uh, the console. So an example, we have this super simple function that's just called welcome that uh, prints out, uh, you know, welcome and then whatever the name is, right? So if we uh, use map, what are we going to get? Well, we do get welcome Hadley and welcome Jenny. That's good. But now we get um, these two uh, these two elements of a list, uh, null and null, and that's not exactly what we want. Almost there, but but not really. Um, and the reason why, right, is that cat and you know stuff or like writes .csv, right? Their return type is null, um, so that stuff gets returned invisibly. Um, usually, you know, if I do something like write .csv to something to disk, right? It's not there's nothing that's going to pop up into my console um, that will like show null, right? That's that stuff is returned invisibly. So uh, we shouldn't really use map in these cases uh, when we're more interested in calling a function and applying it's like some vector um, for its side effects. We should use the walk family of functions, um, and if we use walk in this case, so walk we can then just think of as like map. Uh, it does exactly what we want, right? It prints out welcome Hadley and welcome Jenny to the console, and it doesn't uh, return a list, right, with two, two null elements. Um, so great. And we can, what's also really, you know, useful, let's say, uh, with walk is let's say you want to, like, write a bunch of just, like, uh, CSVs right to disk. Um, so this is an example here um, where we just create a temporary directory, split up empty cars by the cylinder. Um, then we essentially just like create right file paths for each of those. And then we use walk to again, the two part, right? Now we're looping over two elements. Uh, so in this case, I'm looping over the data structures, um, the data frames and sills, uh, the paths, and then that gets supplied to write.csv, right? Because right with write.csv, it's the object that you're writing to a CSV, all then by the path of that. Um, and we just do walk to, and if we look at the temporary directory, uh, here we go. Right. This was I, I actually did this at work the other day to like create um some Excel files. So it was really nice just being able to like use walk to, right? Um, and then just you know, write write whatever work I was doing to Excel. Um even like it's, right so far. Oh, yep. It's it's really excellent if you have to create a lot of different like plots. Like if you have to create a lot of PNG for plots walk uh, all the definitely. time so if you definitely. have like if you have like just like one parameter that changes walk to mm -hmm. just change the parameter and, or even p walk you know change the parameter and then then save it to disk it's just it's amazing no, it's yeah. always, one thing i want to just point out about this it's extremely important when you use walk that you sing along to walk this way by aerosmith as you're doing it <laughs> I'll have to add that, right? Well, I'll have to add those in the notes. That's to be an exercise. <laughs> um, but yeah, also like uh, before we get to the other ones, I think it's also pretty cool too, right? Where really nothing like fundamentally changes, right? We're just looping over more things, right? So like once you really understand like what map does, and like then it's pretty easy then to understand like what map double and map character do. And then when you're like, oh, well, I want to actually loop over like two things or like N things. Well, it's just the same exact logic. Now you're just, but you're just looping over more stuff, right? Um, so you're not really learning anything more. Like as soon as you really understand like map, you kind of, it's like pretty easy then to like dip into the, all the other, um, you know, families of, you know, of per um, and just like apply whatever, you know, knowledge, you know, there to those, even if you've like never used that, right? So like, if you didn't know what walk does, you know what map does and if you know what map does then it's pretty easy to figure out what walk does which i think is you know super um good from like a design perspective um imap so imap right and like r and like i guess probably probably all <laughs> i guess i've really only used other like python and like my day-to-day -day work um but right there's like a bunch of ways to loop over like vectors and stuff one could just be looping over the uh the indexes and one could be looping over like the names of an object assuming that object has um names when i was doing some of the exercises i was like well, imap is weird and then i then i read the documentation so imap is uh 
it's really actually like a shorthand for map two, where in this case, dot y is the names of the um, of the object uh, that you're passing to it. Um, what's one thing also to note is that let's say you're like, oh, I want to use like IMAP and the object that you're passing it doesn't have names. It then just ends up simplifying to map two. So in that case, you really should just use map two, right? Because it'll make it a lot more clear um, with what you're doing. The example uh, Hadley gave was that this could be like really nice if um, you want to like, you know, like print, you know, uh, I, I actually got to forget it was um, essentially, you know, maybe you want to like show some, I don't know, like data about like, here's like sepal length and here's, let's say like the first value of it. I could see this maybe being useful for like, you wanted to create maybe some sort of like custom summary table or like maybe like print out something in a document. Um, I particularly find this the most useful. Like I'm not, I don't know if maybe Colin, you've used it in like your day-to-day -day stuff, um, but I didn't. I haven't found it as useful, but I could also just be wrong. Yeah. Well, in any case, you might be doing like, you know, in Python, you do enumerate quite often, right? When you need to know. True. That actually it's is like true. you're you're if you're working your your movie, you're uh, mapping across one mapping across a thing, but you need to like index into some other array at the same index. Maybe that might be why. Oh, actually, yeah. No, that's actually a good point, right? Because yeah, with like enumerate, that could be. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, that makes sense. Um, what about in situations where you don't know the length of your of the vector or the list that you're going like with that? I mean, I haven't used it very much, but that's what I was thinking is if you didn't know the length of the object, you could just throw IMAP because then it would just use the index, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, I mean, that's the one yeah. thing I'm thinking. I'm, I'm trying to think of a situation where that would come up. <laughs> Well, I was thinking that maybe like in like in the context of Shiny, so like if you're developing a Shiny app and you had some form of dynamic UI and you didn't necessarily know like how much of an input you're going to get, you would have the ability just to seek along or whatever to use that oh, I iterator. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And actually, now even I'm thinking with the numerate in Python, right, there are like times when you're looping over where like maybe you care more about like, okay, if I'm like on this index, I want to do something right. Um, or if like I pass over a name right within that, that object, uh, maybe I want to like do something. So I guess in that case, right, when whatever you're looping over, uh, you care about both like the index and the name, then maybe like right IMAP is a bit more useful. Um, I'd be curious, right, to like see if maybe something comes up for me where I'm like, oh, I need both of these. Um, but, you know, maybe. Um, edge case i mean if you if you had a function that had some type of conditional in it i mean that could be another situation i mean you would have a conditional where it would be like if you knew the index of that element to which you wanted to run the condition but yeah i don't have any solid examples of where i've used it yeah it's hard to think of a good example yep. at the moment. i mean drop my hand like oh what if i had like a a list of and i want a list of numbers and for whatever reason i wanted to double every other one you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> then i could use the i the, the index the second element to like do a modulo two to figure out whether i'm going to double it or not but i mean you know the first one or not but yeah yeah no i think that those, those are definitely i could see that um and then the last one is pmap so we're not going to call you know map three map four no no we're just gonna call it pmap um and in this case what's different with pmap and the whole pmap you know Families so like pmap double, p just break all pmap, p walk, p modify. Is there a p modify? I don't know. There is not. <laughs> Why do you call pmap though. That's what. What's a p? Uh, I I also don't know. <laughs> um, oh, let's see. Is maybe maybe it has in the. Uh, they are parallel. Ah, parallel. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, me. Oops. Let me oh, I see. Ah. P min, P max are defined the same way. I got you. Okay. So it's. Yep. Um, here, wait one sec. Ah, I want to like close out of this, but my Zoom is here one sec. Let me stop sharing and close that out and share again. There's I modify, but there's no P modify. That is weird. Uh -huh. Why not? All right, sorry about that. Um, okay, so right, if we just want to like 
we have and we all loop over any number of inputs. In this case, we will just pass it uh, instead of like you know dot x or dot y. We now have dot l, which we just pass a list to it. So in this case, um, with pmap double, I mean you really wouldn't necessarily do this because you can just use map two. But this is kind of like showing the the function of uh, how it works, right? So in this case, our example, right, where we want to compute like some uh, different, like apply some different like weighted uh, weights to a mean, uh, we now just like pass this a list, right, and pmap double and uh, the weighted mean function, and it returns like the same stuff. And uh, same thing with all the map functions, right? Have dots, so any uh, extra arguments uh, that a function has, you can then just like pass it to the end, and then. Uh, uh, mapping function right we'll figure out how to do it um I think like the you might be obviously asking like why <laughs> like why do we have this um I think and what Hallie uh is saying and I agree with this is um what's really useful about pmap right since we're now passing it a list is that now we have like super fine control over uh argument name matching right um and then you can like kind of create like arbitrarily complicated like data structures right that you want to like apply um function to and that's really nice right that you can do that really easily in a map so in this example um is let's say right we have some we want to apply some like different trimmings to uh these draws from a couchy distribution um we can essentially say trim is equal to trims right uh with we pass it over like this list trim equals trims and then mean and then x equals x so what is this doing well um in this case right trim is an argument to mean and then we're saying that trims uh we're you know assigning trims to that and then we are um right x is equal to x is right just the uh draws from the couchy distribution um a more useful example i think that really kind of shows it off a bit better is um this one right here. So we have this triple of uh, just different values that we're going to be supplying to the uh, random uniform function. So the you know, first row has like you know one draw, and then these are the you know parameters for that uniform distribution. This one has two draws, but these parameters, and this one has three draws. Um, what's really nice about that is that you can just pass a tibble in this case of all the parameters that you want and then the function that we want to apply it to um remember obviously that like data frames are just list of vectors this is why obviously that works um and we now get returned a list of um of uh, draws from a uniform distribution um where each element right corresponds to um a certain row of um of parameters so that's really nice right if you like for whatever reason, may, maybe you were like testing out, I guess in this case, right, like uh, different draws from like, you know, different parameters of a uniform distribution. Um, you can do that like really neatly by just assigning um, like what the arguments names are and then just assigning values to those. Um, so that's like, you know, pretty useful uh, with PMAP. Um, I guess the, again, the takeaway is that PMAP just gives you pretty fine, you're at right fine grain control over uh, argument name matching. So if you also need to like loop over like three, four, how many ever, how many ever objects you need to loop over pmap is um pretty useful um so let's skip some of this stuff and so the reduce family of um functionals i didn't i'll be honest i didn't focus on this one as much um but i you know obviously still go through it um so in this case the example that we were given is what if we wanted to find uh the elements that are or, you know, associated with like each element of this list. Uh, so if we were just doing this manually, we'd um, we assign the first element of the list to this variable out, and then we just repeatedly apply intersect to uh, each element of the of the list, um, each element of each list, and then we'd eventually find out that you know, in this case, the vec the, the numbers four, seven, eight, and five are shared across um, each list. Um, we can just use reduce. To actually though handle that for us so in this case um we'll just pass it a vector and we'll apply you know in the, this functional intersect and then that will return the same thing right um so i'll show you like again like taking some more like complicated data structure and then like literally right reducing it to the values that um, or value or values that you want um in this case you could do union so um jesus why, why am i forgetting what union does um if i will I show the <laughs> I, I'm I'm 
you know what? We have documentation. <laughs> Union. Okay. Uh, I know it's I the sets. So like, but doesn't no, it just gives uh, you the set that, that has all the elements in both sets. Oh yeah. Um, so then for 10. Oh yeah. Yeah. The elements. That, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So in this case, right. Intersect will show you, okay, like what is shared across of each. And this will just, you know, show you the elements that are associated in all of them. I think I said that right. Maybe. <laughs> um, and then this is the for loop um, implementation of simple reduce, um, where we assign the first element of vector, uh, you know, to some this is a variable called out. And then we loop, we start looping from the second element. And then we, you know, apply a function uh, to out. And then, you know, then we'll eventually. Uh, just get a vector out of that. Accumulate is the inverse of reduce. So while reduce shows you the end result of, um, you know, applying this function however many times to the element, uh, accumulate will show you all the intermediate calculations. So in this case with intersect, right, we start with uh, the full list and then we gradually break it down um, to then find out all the elements um, that are so that are you know in each um, in each sub list. So in this case, the last element is what we would get what we would have got out if we just used reduce. Um, so that's you know pretty if you want to like see see you know those like intermediate calculations for whatever reason. Um, this one was oh I guess right you're just essentially like essentially you're just applying right a plus right because everything and like also are like functions um so you're just applying right you're just like summing up um each element of the list or sorry the vector and this one is like accumulating right is just showing um you know the, the intermediate steps um so in this you know it's kind of like a cumulative sum and output types i believe right like this works Actually, that actually does work. This part, this I honestly, getting... I, yeah, th oh. this was the part, I'll be honest, I did not put a ton of focus on this one. Um, but yeah, it took me like a few read throughs to, I think, to understand it, where it's like, if you give it a single length vector, it's always going to return that single length. Mm -hmm. So I think like the big picture of it was, is like, hey, if you are going to use reduce in a function that you write, then you should define dot in it equals zero. So in the case that a user has an input that has a zero length integer, it will always return zero rather than what they inputted into it. I think it was with the big picture of it. Yeah, got it. It threw so me I, off. Like, it threw me yeah. off when I was talking about algebraic and all that stuff. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, like I, I was like looking at it. I'm like, I. I'm going to be honest. I'm like, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to necessarily use this. I probably might use this at one point in my life. I, I imagine. Um, I, or, or rather like I could see using reduce and accumulate. I think I just got, yeah. kind of got lost on the, uh, like, you know, what you were saying, right. Colin with like the algebra stuff and like the types. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting bored <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I yeah. Think, well, what's, what's nice about this. And I think Ryan, you had something to add here. Um, but, um, with reduce, like it's great if you are doing a lot of table joins. Like if you're doing a lot of table joins, you can just create a vector of those tables and then just run reduce with the table join you want to do. Like, right? Most of it's going to probably be a left join. Okay. If you want to left join all those tables, use reduce just to left join all those tables. So, but so you were yeah. going to say something, Ron. No, I was just going to say it does come, it comes in handy quite a bit once you know about it. I mean, I'm used to it because it's against a, a lot of these things remind me of Haskell and other languages like that, but particularly Haskell because Haskell, like that's one of the first things you, you first things you learn about are map. The second thing you learn about is reduce. I mean, uh, which is called fold in Haskell, but it's basically the same exact thing. And being able to take a list and then like you know run and you know replace basically. Well, I shouldn't say that. Am I? <laughs> I was going to say something, but I realized it wasn't going to help. Be very helpful because <laughs> it requires understanding lists in a different way, but. Um, but yeah, it's a great way to reduce the list down to one number to somehow like take all of, you know, just imagine you have a list all laying out whatever it is, and then taking every comma, right, and replacing it with some operator like a plus or multiply yep. or union or whatever you want. That's what I, how I kind of think of it in my head is what it's doing. Except yeah, it's actually I, doing it in an associative way, but still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'll definitely have to reread. I definitely have to reread that part a bit. But yeah. that was probably the one part where I'm like, okay, this is a bit shaky for me. Um, like obviously, when you with, reduce with a plus, right? And then with a knit of zero, well, we reduce with plus, right? You have your list. It's like written out, like you know, C zero one two three four five with commas, right? Then take all the commas and put pluses, and that's basically what reduce is doing. Mm -hmm. But I left out the only thing I left out in that description is where the parentheses go because it can matter, right? And does God. does it always mm -hmm. fold left? Because like in uh, in I fold right in Haskell, there's actually a fold left and a fold right because some sometimes you want to associate to the right and sometimes you want to associate to the left on your list. But I think reduce mm -hmm. always just does left, which is fine. I mean, hmm. I know everybody in Advent and Code. They were always trying to find situations where they could apply reduce. Yeah, I mean that's just I, I hear every like. <laughs> Oh my That's gosh, true. This is the first time I ever used the reduce function. I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't even understand the problem, but yet you're applying reduce to this. So, okay. I mean, I've only used it in having a code to you, but um, because mostly what I'm doing is just going to be modify, you know, using standard deployer stuff, right? But um, it's nice to know about it, at least. Maybe sometime you have to use it, you'll be able to. Now you yeah. know about it, I think you might find more. I hope, I should say me. Now that I know about it, I think I will find more uses for it than I have in the past. Definitely. No promises. Um, oh, check me. The, oh, there is a direction. See forward and backward. That's an option. Dot dir. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the I guess with yep. the whole map produced. That's stuff. cool. Oh, sorry. I just I just want to interrupt. Oh no, that's really cool. It does give you this dot. You can specify the direction. It will do what's essentially a left reduce or a right reduce. If you look at the documentation of Prairie, you'll see that, that that's what, exactly what it does. It's like instead of one, you know, one plus two parentheses plus three, you can do it the other way. So it's one plus parentheses two plus mm. three now it doesn't matter for addition because you know it's cumulative and associated but for other operations binary operations it might matter so you, you want to make sure you do it the right way that you want got it no, that makes there's sense. also a re there's also a reduce right and a reduce to right in the in the definitions oh. too or in the oh. functions that are available <laughs> yeah those are got soft it. deprecated they said so. oh they're depreciated yeah they're deprecated yep retired so never mind forget that <laughs> um the I guess like right with the whole map reduce stuff right the most not famous is not the right word I'll just use famous I can't really think of it right now most famous example right map reduce um right oh, where, sure, you, know, right. you obviously famous. apply a mapping function and yeah. then reduce and reduce and that's you know it, it was a very small uh, little bit uh it's kind of like saying like here's like a real world application of like something that's actually like pretty big and massive right changed a bunch of uh early yeah. like you know when the whole you know big data era <laughs> right like all of that stuff um so that's like obviously a pretty um well-known example well known is the better word not famous um all right next stuff is predicate functionals so we're defining a predicate as a function that returns like a single true or false some you know use examples like is dot character right is what the object that i'm passing to it, this um um is this object that i'm passing right a a character vector right and it will only return a single true or false so it will obviously return true if all the elements are um are a character and false if like let's say one isn't um is not numeric right it's another example etc cetera, etc cetera. um a predicate functional kind of takes the idea of a predicate right and then just applies a predicate to each um element of a given vector um so we can kind of you know we can look at some examples of this so we have some data frame over here, right, with just the columns X and Y. And if I use detect, so detect, uh, and then I pass it a predicate, in this case is dot character, this will return to me um, the first, the first uh, match, um, and then we're like return the values associated with it. So in this case, it will return uh, me the vector uh, Y, right, and, you know, I'll output like this. A uh, detect index is like pretty much the same idea as detect. In this case, though, I just get the index of where that is. So in this case, it's saying, hey, this is the second column is uh, character. And again, right, uh, let's say you had another character column. Let's let's just say Z, right? It has maybe, you know, some other letters in it. Um, it will only return Y because if I remember correctly reading the documentation, detect only returns like the first match. Um, keep is actually kind of cool and keep and discard. Uh, so let's say I have, again, this data frame, right? I only want to keep the uh, columns that are of a uh, character data type. So in this case, it would re it would return a data frame um, of just, again, a of uh, column Y. And then discard is, in this case, I want to discard um, 
Jesus. Um, why is this? Can you guys not hear me? Oh my God. No, no, I no we hear you. We hear you fine. Okay. Why is, I'm just trying to, uh, I've, just, I've forgotten about this part. I'm like, what exactly is the difference between detect and keep? Uh, maybe, maybe my keyboard just died. Maybe that was the problem. Well, uh, okay. We're going to use a laptop. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, all right. So discard in this case uh, will remove, will drop any, um, any, you know, columns in the data frame that are in this case a factor. Uh, since we didn't have any, you know, it just keeps the same thing. This is definitely like, I, I can see like super cool, right? If maybe, maybe, actually I could see this with, um, what should I call it? Maybe like, you know, you have like some categorical data, right? You want to like maybe split that out, right? And like handle that stuff separately. And maybe your numeric data, um, maybe, maybe you want to like keep it like two separate data frames. You can, you know, keep in this card. Um, I think they're like super useful for that. Um, this, this is also is, this. Oh, yep. Oh, keep and discard is really great. If you're like, if you're trying to make a request into an API and you know, it's like in return, like an empty list, like if you're paging or something like that, and you know, it's going to return an empty list and one of the iterations, great. Just to use keep or discard to just get rid of like empty lists or whatever. It's, it's saved me so oh, many yeah. times. Uh, oh Yeah. That definitely is useful. <laughs> oh, I can see that. Um, then we just have some quick variants. So I know Colin was mentioning this before, right? Uh, a lot of, I don't want to say all of them, but I believe many of them, right? The mapping functions we've learned about in per um, have like, you know, if as an example, right? Um, so let's say again, we have this other data frame and over here, we want to uh, apply the mean function only if uh, the column is numeric. Uh, so in this case, that will return a list. Um, where we get the mean right for number one and sorry for columns uh, num one and num two right but we don't get it for um, uh, in this case you know character one right because it isn't a numeric vector right it's a character vector um, I know there's obviously some other like argument handling that you can do right within like map if functions right you can like give it an else condition um, you know in case like your uh, the predicate you're giving it to it you know it returns false. Uh, modify if right we know that modify just uh, returns the uh, object of the same type as the input so it's the same thing right um, so instead of getting a list returned we get a data frame um, returned but you will notice that maybe this isn't not maybe not necessarily the best thing we want to do right because um, right the mean is just going to return one value and this case right because of ours uh, vector recycling rules um, now we, we do get back a data frame but we do now get like uh, um, the right the mean like repeated up to like the length of the data frame um that can maybe be useful i know if, like some applications right like if you do um you know like with window functions at least that's where my brain's going to right now um where you want to like keep like the same size of whatever your input object is but maybe that isn't what you want and then keep um so this and with keep right we want to again apply a predicate and um you know a predicate function and then some function we want to apply to it is true um, in this case you'll notice that um where map if returns you every column right of the um of the data frame and then it will apply mean to um all the numeric columns keep will first check like okay all, which columns are uh, numeric columns and then it'll apply the mean to it but it will only return you uh the columns in this case where um that that condition was satisfied um which also initially threw me off because I was kind of expecting Matt if to do what keep does, but then I was like looking back, I'm like, okay, that actually makes more sense that um, keep should do that and right map if just probably uh, not modify the object um, necessarily, right? If the condition um, isn't true. And oh, yeah, right here. So last two sections, super quick. Um, we just get a quick little tour of some of the base functionals, right? We've been obviously exposed to it with like L apply, V apply, S apply. Um, apply is very useful. Um, if let's say, you know, you have, uh, you, you know, it, I would say it's like, to me, it seems like the most general one. Um, and I, I've been reading, uh, I know, uh, what statistical rethinking by Richard McElroy. So I know he uses this function a ton, uh, because most of his objects, um, return matrices in his, uh, rethinking library. Apply is actually really cool. Um, where, 
compared to like other other uh, apply functions, right? That might return a list or a vector. Um, apply also lets you uh, control in which direction you want to apply the function to. So in this case, one will apply to the rows of this matrix uh, A two D, whereas um, uh, two in this case will apply it down to the column. So in this case, um, yeah. Or did I actually did I flip that? No, no, no. That's that. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is right. One applies to the rows of the matrix. Two applies now mean down, you know, to the columns. Um, so that you know, if, let's say depending on what you're doing, you want to you care more about like applying some function to the rows or or columns of a ma of a uh, matrix, right? That's useful. Um, you can apply it also in this case. Um, you can you know apply it to both both of them, right? And then you also get like the same stuff. Um, over here. Um, oh, actually, sorry, you can apply to arrays, my bad. So, you know, arrays, right, will have, will, which will have uh, more dimensions, just rows and columns. I can then uh, now pass like a vector in this case, where I want to apply to uh, the first, let's just say like layer and the second layer, right, of this array um, to like the second argument apply. The kind of the one issue, right, with apply and some of the, obviously the base R functionals um, is that you don't have any control over the return type. So, Kind of like right with s apply s apply will usually return you a vector right but like not always um it will try to obviously simplify give you the simplest object it can so that is like something obviously to watch out with apply um that it might return an object that you're not necessarily um expecting and also like here right like we can um actually i guess in here you i forget exactly why this doesn't work uh argument is not new. oh yeah because in this case right um we're trying to compute like the mean of um of y and that doesn't make any sense because there is no way of like thinking uh of like applying a, a mean to like a character vector um so again yeah stuff to watch out for um when you're using like some of the base r functionals um but i will say that at least for me uh, at least going through this chapter some of the base r functionals do make a lot more sense to me um in terms of like when i when i see it in other people's code um, some, you know, some ways I feel like, you know, per gives you a more coherent, right. Um, developer experience that when you then do like, look at base R stuff or when you use right base R functionals, you're like, oh, okay. Like this is what this thing is doing. And then all I have to really like think about is like just doing argument matching, right. Cause there is some consistency inconsistencies, right. Where I think it's like L apply will have like these like, uh, arrangement of, of arguments, but like something like V apply or like S apply will have a different set. And then, you know, that does, uh, doesn't allow you then to like do, you know, piping as an example, um, which you can do with all the per per functionals because um, they all share like the same um, argument um, order. Last bit is um, just showing, you know, some off some mathematical functionals, right? Uh, functionals are like super common in math. And I'm not really gonna like talk about these this one like as much, but you know, unit roots a functional, integrates a functional, right? In this case is applying the sign, you know, sign, um over you know pi or sorry sign with you know the bound zero to pi um and yeah i mean they're just you know just you know these mathematical functions functionals um and that's yeah that's really it that's all i had sweet that was a good coverage of yeah. uh, chapter number nine that was great appreciate it uh, um i was just thinking about the keep function a little bit more um, I'm wondering if like our keep or discard, I wonder if they're using the attribute of the type, right? I wonder if it's using that attribute if it's keeping or dropping. I don't know, just maybe curious. I didn't know if anybody knew like if it's using the attribute to drop and keep those objects. But... The, I, I don't know if I'm following. So like, if it's like, cause you would be passing an object, right? Or you would be mm -hmm. passing a list through keep and those, the list would contain objects. Those objects would have a specific type and that type is determined by the attribute of that object, right? It's that metadata that's attached to the object. Yep. So I'm wondering if it's using that like extra attribute as it's like, if it's if it's a you know a double character or whatever it drops it because of that attribute data not necessarily because of the type if i'm making any sense i don't know i was just thinking about that but 
I have oh, I mean, more digging. yeah, maybe you could, because like I'm just right. It's like dot p is it says predicate function, right? Obviously, returns just true or false. I mean, you probably could, right? Maybe I'm not sure if like maybe internally if it's using like the attributes, but like you could just write a predicate function that maybe only applies this function based off of the attributes of the object, right? Maybe you have, you know, mm -hmm. um, like you write an example, like um, I'm thinking like with uh, like BRMS has like its own, like it's, it's still a table, but like it has, it's a bit more custom, right? It has um, some extra columns. Like maybe you could just write a function that does that too, right? That would just say like, oh, does like the saying have like this attribute? And if not, then, you know, um, then apply the function otherwise don't um which is also then really cool right because then you could like then use stuff like with like attributes and and other stuff where it right um assuming like i'm correct i could be totally wrong <laughs> um but uh right that, that could definitely be another case um we're using like other you know metadata right about the object you're working with yeah i mean maybe that's a little bit more advanced than i mean if you're going beyond like is that double is that numeric yeah I mean, like maybe you're just hacking it more than you're using it yeah. for what it's intended. So, yeah. Although like, you know, I guess it right, depends on the application, right? Like as long as I guess you can formulate your code, run a function you want to apply it to whatever predicate you want to make. Right. Then like, I assume it should still be easy. I might actually play around with that um, to see. Um, that's not because I was thinking like I was like thinking about like the underlying of like the ggplot, you know, like a ggplot two object, right? Like if you mm -hmm. ever like dig into like a ggplot two object, there's just like so much. It's a list. It's a list. Yep. But it contains like every like a lot of different elements within it. So say you wanted to like capture just like keep certain elements within that. I don't know what, but I don't know. Oh yeah. Actually, maybe. Yeah, why not? Right. Um, obviously, yeah, I think like what you said, it's definitely like probably more advanced, like than just like, is this thing a double? Right. Um, but I would <laughs> imagine the same logic applies. Like, I don't, I guess I can't think of a way where that where like you couldn't do that. Actually, it would be super interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's a half baked idea right now. So <laughs> <laughs> came up on the fly. <laughs> Uh, Ron, do you have anything else that you want to discuss or add or? Nope, not really. I mean, I think it's a complicated chapter. This is, in my mind, I'm just thinking this as we're kind of getting introduced to these things and now we're going to try to, we should try to use them um, more and more just to get get more familiar with them. I mean, the map stuff is pretty clear. Some of the stuff at the end is like, you know, the predicate and keeping and discards. I'm going to have to get some practice so I feel comfortable with any of those. Mm. But, yeah, otherwise, I, yeah, pretty cool. The R4DS, like they, they updated to the second edition for R4DS, but they used to, in the iteration chapter, have some really like good use cases for keep and discard, but I was trying to dig for them, but I can't, I can't oh, find them anymore. anymore. So, which is yeah. important, you probably find the first edition still up somewhere, but I thought yeah. there were some good examples in that chapter, but. Well, according to this right, thing, cool. the second edition is still in progress being updated, so who knows? who knows maybe they'll add it because i thought those like like i said like i learned keep when with a little trick of like if you were going to like do a bunch of joins like if you had a bunch of tables and you were going to do like a bunch of left joins like say you had four tables and you knew you were just going to left join all of them just do yeah. a just do a just do a reduce or something like that but you know it's just little tricks you pick up um, okay, cool. Well, uh, let's see. I think I am next up to talk about, um, let me just double check to talk about chapter number 10, which is function factories. Um, I've already kind of read ahead on that chapter. Uh, there's going to be some points in that chapter that I think I'm going to have to just briefly address, uh, <laughs> especially when it's like maximum likelihood and all that stuff. I might have to just touch on that. Um, but I do, after reading it, uh, do I think a good refresher would be to go back to that environments chapter because I think the environments chapter really knowing that stuff is really important to know like how function factories work um, just a heads up because I found that to be beneficial to go back to that chapter reread okay. it and then read read um, function factories but because it uses environments um, which 
I've, I've been playing around with environments lately, oddly enough. So, um, and they're not as esoteric as you think they are because there are some use to them. So, uh, okay, cool. Well, I mean, I can hang out for a little bit longer if you guys want to talk about something else. Other than that, I mean, we'll, I'll see you all next week and we'll start our conversation of function factories. So, all right, function cool. factories, it is. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, I'll see you guys later. All right, see you. Bye, guys. All right, talk to you later.